uh, well, before I um, uh, introduce myself, I thought I'd just acknowledge that I am um, speaking from Jara people's country. Jajarong people have been uh, living and holding ceremony and ritual on this country for at least 40, maybe 50,000 years and uh, are continuing to hold ceremony and rituals of renewal on this land. And it is Jara spirit and Jajarong uh, economy and culture that um, I have personally drawn a lot of um, my inspiration for uh, working as a permaculture um, teacher and also as a regenerator of forests and uh, I guess a holistic uh, economic um, uh, activist, I, I suppose, is, is another uh, clunky label for what I do. I have uh, a number of degrees in the arts. Um, I have a doctorate in the ecological humanities as a poet, but what I'm specifically interested in is working in the neighborhood sphere. So working with neighbors um, and very close community kin to um, walk the talk uh, of ecological renewal and ecological culture and ecological economy. I guess um, I'm a collaborator in many, many different forms. Um, some of those include um, men's, uh, men's uh, circles or fire circles or grief rituals, democratic renewal in local government. I'm on a group called Community Voice. Uh, we here live without a car. We, uh, I call ourselves neo-peasants because we um, are really reclaiming our ancestral connection to land, even though our ancestors are from um, mainly Europe and the Middle East. Um, and when I say we, I'm talking about um, my household and many volunteers uh, that, that come and live and learn permaculture and neo-peasant life ways and economy here on Jarrah country. So um, tonight uh, we're going to um, start by looking at a, uh, watching a 12 minute film that uh, Jordan Osmond made from Happen Films. Uh, and that will kind of give a little bit of insight into the, uh, the type of forest that we're, that's just on our, which is about a two minute walk behind me. Um, we're right on the edge of suburbia in a town of 3,000 people, and we are surrounded by forests. And in the winter, they are wet, uh, luscious forests full of water. And in summer, um, that forest becomes tinder and very flammable. So um, I'd like to talk to you about um, goats as fire mitigation and also as ecological um, weeders uh, and renewers of, of country. So I think, Nicole, if, if we could um, go to the film now and then come back and I'll say a few more words. Really what we're trying to do is to transition weedy forests into grassy woodlands. And once the grassy woodlands return, wallabies and kangaroos can come into the forest and start maintaining it. The problem with land management as it applies to blackberries is, is this sort of mentality of correct and incorrect, good and bad, um, good and evil. In that sort of classic permacultural principle or permacultural understanding that the problem is the solution rather than seeing blackberries as the enemy, understanding blackberries as the nurse plant, their habitat, their soil builders, their soil stabilizes, but understanding that its dominance is disabling biodiversity because it's covering the entire forest. They pose a huge fire risk when they're two and four meters high. Each year the canes die back and then the new leaves and canes grow on top. And so they just keep amassing each year. And what's left in the middle is basically tinder ready to fuel fire so if embers from a fire get into them um, they can rush up and the blackberries often grow up trees so they can um, fuel crown fires because they're m making the fire go up right up into the eucalypts. The Country Fire Authority 
otherwise known as the CFA, about seven years ago did a big burn through this forest. This is necessary work in terms of protecting the town. But from an uh, ecologist perspective, um, I kind of reeled back after seeing that work. A lot of the hawthorns were burnt severely and many of the hawthorns have ringtail possum drays built in them. Over the next two or three years, the blackberry and gorse came back with a vengeance because fire often puts the weed cycle back at stage one. Watching the takeover of blackberries and um, gorse come back and thinking there's got to be another way of doing this so that in another five or six years, the CFA don't come back and burn again. There must be another way of transitioning the forest to a much lower fire risk forest, but without destroying habitat, without destroying uh, the ecology. So originally starting by boarding down the blackberries um, and chopping and dropping the thicker canes has transitioned to using goats uh, who do this work so effectively and quietly and gently the goats we're using are boar goats or boar crosses. They can pretty much survive on blackberries. They'll eat the leaves, they love the leaves. They love the fruit when it's fruiting. And if you leave them in there long enough, they'll eat the canes to a degree, you know, especially the soft shoots. They do like other things. They love hawthorn, holly, broom, gorse, all the prickly things. Our idea is that after three or four years, of goats grazing with the first year, the first season being quite intensive in order to get these two to four metre blackberry brambles down onto the ground. Then by the next year, they've come back to a certain degree. Um, so an acre might take a month for our herd to completely flatten and put down onto the ground. The next year, it might take 10 days, and then the following year, a week, and then the following year after that, just a few days. The plant life of the forest floor returns. In that diversity, there's insect diversity. And with insect diversity, small mammals have got much more food. And then with smaller mammals, larger predatory birds and owls and raptors. Plant biodiversity equals animal biodiversity. It's this very simple interrelationship. The goats are happy, you're, you keep providing them land and we're happy because uh, they're doing work that um, is transforming the ecology, is, is moving it into its next phase of succession. This forest has grown me up. It has enabled me to see the importance of wildness in our very domesticated lives. If there is a relationship between wildness and the domesticated aspects of our lives, then um, I feel like we're going to be people who know how to work with the land again. I'm a second people's person on first people's country, but I have my own first people's ancestry to draw on, and we all do. We all come from first peoples somewhere in the world, and those stories are important because we haven't always been um, tremelers of land. So this forest has enabled me to uh, have an education of what I would call the living of the world, be a student of the living of the world, and be a participant of the living of the world. And that has given me some hope. <laughs> yeah, that has given me some hope. Yeah, and joy. And just to get back to this, this absolute basics. With all my university education and all the busyness and all the noise of social media and all the noise of our culture, really, this, this is our way back to um, sanity. <laughs> Whatever relationship we can have with this, this material is not a story of domination.
we have just finished a spring flora count in that land that you just saw on the, in the video. So that video was taken um, in winter and we counted 35 indigenous species that have returned to country in the last two years since the goats have been on that land. So prior to that, um, the great majority of that land was covered in two to four metre high blackberry. And then we take them off through this, uh, the spring and summer so that the, uh, the recharge can happen. Documenting this process as we go um, is a big part of what we do. And if you want to uh, see the, the video that documents that ecological recharge, um, we've just posted that on our Artist as Family YouTube page. So 35 species um, of indigenous flora that uh, was not there um, because mainly because the blackberries had shaded everything out. The reason why the blackberries are there in the first place is that that gully system um, was eradicated of all trees and plants for the pursuit of gold in the 1850s to the 1880s. And um, at that time, uh, uh, when colonization was taking place, which started in the 1840s in this area, um, so there was a whole lot of uh, migrants from Europe and uh, Asia that came in seek of uh, search of gold. And uh, a lot of plants uh, came um, either uh, by chance or, um, or through because of cultivation with uh, newcomers, such as my ancestors. I guess what we're trying to do is to, to marry um, the incredible uh, biological controlling um, qualities of goats, um, but at the same time understand the, the ecology and understand that if we just kept the goats on that land permanently, they would actually send it backwards. So it's, it's knowing when to put the goats on into a forest and when to take them out. I mean, I, I think this sort of is a general permaculture principle or a, a, a peasant principle of not having them permanently fenced. And there's many ways to do that. We use solar fencing because, um, because we simply don't have the culture to have shepherds. Um, we, ha we are goat herders, but we check on them maybe two or three times a day. We're not, none of us can afford the time to be with them uh, 24 hours uh, around the clock. So um, we don't want them wandering off into areas which are either ecologically sensitive or socially sensitive, such as neighbors, rose gardens. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's really, um, I guess the electric fencing is a very low tech way of um, touching the forest floor very lightly. Yeah, I just wanted to understand, uh, this blackberry is a, 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 like a endemic species or an exotic uh, because it's a large uh, landmass, so uh, that also yeah. uh, depends on it, like uh, why it has been able to take up so much uh, space and become a, mm. such a dominant species. Yeah, so it is an exotic species and in most parts of Australia it uh, in many parts of Australia, it, it doesn't do very well because it's just too dry. But we are in um, a wetter part of Australia. So when the blackberries are kept really down low and even just as a ground cover, not only a whole lot of other plants can start to come up and then shade out the blackberries, but as a low ground cover, they're actually fire mitigating. Whereas left to become brambles, they're fire enhancing. The types of grassy woodlands that existed here before colonization um, were able to be um, uh, burnt in, in very sophisticated ecological ways. So uh, Aboriginal people across Australia have um, um, extremely sophisticated uh, ways of managing uh, the country with fire. Unfortunately, a lot of that information um, has been destroyed. Traditional burning or Aboriginal burning is coming back to Australia in many parts of the, of the country. And that's a really interesting ecological space to, um, to observe and to, and to watch that um, knowledge renewal. 
Um, however, unfortunately, because of colonization and uh, the punitive um, and uh, the way in which Aboriginal people were treated, a lot of the, the ecological knowledges that were built up over thousands and thousands of years, um, it, it's not fast to put that knowledge back. And what remains, um, uh, the knowledge that remains is, is enough for renewal, but it's, it's you know, we also... We, we, we need to attend to the, the, uh, the problems of um, introduced weed species, um, but also not, as I said in the film, not from a good and evil perspective. I, I really believe we have to get, get beyond the wars um, against invasive species. Most pioneer species, newcomer species that are dominant are there for a reason. They're doing... Um, soil repair they're building like blackberry canes themselves build soil structure they're an amazing material for humus production and and they break down very quickly and blackberry canes are full of lignin and so you'll you'll find that you, with every weed species there's is both a good and bad narrative depending on where you're coming from and and whether you're human or non-human um so i think yeah we have to get away from reductionist and simplistic thinking of good and evil species. Um, the blackberries are here, unless we continue to pour um, thousands and thousands of litres of pesticides onto them or burnt them um, in non-traditional ways, or as Brad said, using bulldozers and excavators uh, to, to remove them, which is, which is all just a waste of, of very high carbon energy. Pesticides, uh, what I call cheekily white fella burning techniques, which are, are pretty reductive burning techniques. They're not nuanced and ecological burning like indigenous Australians developed. Um, and of course, using big excavators and machines. These are all high carbon um, modes of uh, management. And <laughs> the world can't afford to use those, those forms. So I guess, you know, to recall our kind of um, a recall for a, a, a peasantry for working, you know, re responding to what our ancestors, many of us around the world come from indigenous or peasant ancestries. Um, and we have stories uh, that can bring us back to those sorts of simple and low carbon responses to the predicaments of our time. So it's a holistic process too, because the goats, uh, the male goats that we have, a surplus of male goats become part of our food, which is, the, and the food that, 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 um, that comes from the goats is made from weeds. So we have this high protein product that is walked for, that needs no transportation, no veterinary bills, no industrial inputs whatsoever. Um, and then uh, we have meat about once a week or once every fortnight to, to basically convert um, woody weeds into some of the most nutritional meat in the world. Goats eat herbs and medicine plants. They don't eat pasture. <laughs> so they, they take all that, that pharmacopoeia of medicine from a, a huge range of plants, um, particularly uh, as I said, there is a lot of blackberries there, but there are also a lot of other plants and herbs and beneficial um, medicine plants for them. And the indigenous plant, blackwood, wattle, for example, is a natural worming, um, is a natural wormer for goats. So, um, yeah, there's, we're finding out a lot about plants and what they do for the health of not, not just goats, but ourselves as well. We're not... Um, collapsing the fact that um, we are also choosing to be uh, to re reclaim our peasant a uh, ancestry and there is great privilege in that. So I just want to acknowledge that privilege. Um, and, and while many people in the world are moving away from uh, uh, their peasant past and moving towards um, more city and industrial forms of, uh, of culture and economy, um, I suppose after three or four generations of being detached from that, I'm, I'm really seeking out um, my peasant ancestry um, because I feel like um, 
peasant and indigenous cultures and economies are actually um, can hold the world. And help with the questions, uh, Patrick. So uh, Melanie uh, is a um, uh, previous student of environmental science uh, and now an active learner of different ecological management techniques. Um, she's curious uh, how you were able to get this started. Uh, what the be the beginning of the community interaction was like. That's the first question. Maybe yeah. we can take that first. Thank you. And uh, yeah, maybe sorry, connected how neighbors are feeling about it now. So how it started mm -hmm. and uh, what it's like right at the moment. David Holmgren, who's one of the co-originators of the permaculture movement, lives in this area and is a friend. And I was, uh, as a young person, seeing what he and Sue, his partner, and the community just down uh, five kilometers away had been doing for many, many years. And um, working in really what, I guess, what is called a commons. Um, and to to grow uh, timber trees, to regenerate the forest ecologically for more than human um, benefits, uh, and also for food purposes. So, um, and seeing that work was, uh, well, I guess our work is, is, is a kind of social succession and ecological succession on from that work. So our forest is quite different. Uh, we, um, our neighborhood is different. We have a different organization, but the, the seed of it, I guess, came from David and Sue. And thinking about a responsibility beyond our own households, like how, how do we engage with land that is uh, common? And there's an amazing um, indigenous scholar uh, and philosopher called Tyson Yunker Porter, who uh, is really worth checking out. His book, um, Sand Talk, is um, a, a phenomenal book. And he, he talks about the need to produce a custodial, that we become a custodial species again. And, and so I feel like David and Sue's work down in the gully really was the infancy of of them becoming custodial species of place and working with neighbors um, in a shared space. Now, we're, and we're doing uh, that here with neighbors. So building relationships, not just um, with goats and trees and plants and uh, kangaroos and wallabies and every, everyone that, that lives in that forest much more than human, but relationships with neighbors are just critical. Uh, it only takes one neighbor to, to not like what you're doing and they can ring the authorities and the local council will kick us off. And then friends of ours um, across the town, this has happened to them. So really um, building relationships with neighbors to give a uh, social license for this sort of work in a world of insane bureaucracy. Councils and uh, government authorities that have a, have a very short, um, budgetary um, perspective um, time frame aren't looking at say what goats investing in goats over five years will actually do to reduce fire risk and enhance ecological um, biodiversity which improves water quality which has all these spin-off effects which reduces um, greenhouse emissions so unfortunately we're still stuck in this mentality of uh, quick and cheap solutions rather than slow uh, and steady uh, responses to the predicaments of our time. And so um, we do have time to be more measured in our responses and also to move past this idea of the solution to the problem and concentrate on dynamic uh, and localized responses to the predicaments of our time. I think that's much more nuanced and much more complex and less reductive way to think about things and also if we go fast and furious um uh, you know with things like pesticides and bu bulldozers we we do a lot of, lot more damage than we do good and it it may stop the fire cycles for a year or two with those uh, industrial forms of management but um the weed cycles come back with a vengeance um weeds love rupture they love disturbed soil that's how why the world is full of weeds is because there's so much rupturing, because there's so much development. 
Um, then I'm going into, thank you, thank you, Patrick, for that. Uh, I'm going to Sabina's comment. Um, thank you. Hi, Sabina. Uh, Sabina works for the local government in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, as an intern for the Department of Ecology. Um, she says that she's finding the solution interesting, uh, that they've also had uh, fires during the summer in, uh, in Bosnia, um, but even though they don't have bushes, they still have the problem of access uh, to different kinds of forests. And this kind of, uh, and connected to Melanie's last question, actually, uh, how um, scalable is the solution and how applicable it is to other contexts? Mm. Um, we're working on a very small scale, but in places like uh, California, um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of goats are being used um, in one of the most fire prone regions in the world. Um, and as many of us will know, California has really been uh, hit by some serious um, fire cycle summers in the last several years, uh, getting worse and worse. So goats have been used. There is quite a lot online. Uh, there's newspaper articles in, in parts of the world where it's got uh, uh, really bad. Um, governments and agencies are actually spending money. But I guess our thing is we, we are in a very uh, fire prone region here, um, like most of Australia, but it is it is the second most fire prone region in Victoria, um, according to uh, state agencies. I, it's so great to have advocates in government. Uh, we don't currently have any advocates in local government or state government or federal government working behind us. So we're not waiting for them to catch up. But if you are someone working in, in government uh, and you have a fire area, it's really worth ex uh, exploring the idea with local goat herders, local families. Maybe in your area there are traditional uh, families who, um, who need revitalization of their economy. And maybe uh, tradition, I know I've, I've seen an amazing video of traditional goat herders in India. Um, and there, there's real social issues there um, of access to land. Uh, and this traditional way of managing land is being um, enclosed um, because, uh, because of uh, m m modern pressures. The, the revitalization of peasant approaches to and indigenous appro approaches to, to land management is really critical, I think, in this age. And, and to, to move where we can beyond the industrial and back into biological responses. And ultimately, goats are biological responses. They're biological controls that um, can also um, create local economies. Uh, and they can be non-monetary economies like our small scale venture is, or many, many families can be employed um, to do this work. So uh, in, in the monetary or formal economy. So I want to ask something completely different, if I may, Patrick. Yes. Um, because um, I haven't met you before. You, you, your work is extremely interesting. And I think that you have... Uh, um, you come from a country where um, there is a large focus uh, on the re the relationship towards the um, the first people, the the Abor Aboriginal communities, and and their uh, and the knowledge that has been lost over the years. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that is very that I've been thinking a lot since I've started working in environmental education is this um, the almost dichotomy uh, approach between the youth and what, what it is that we need to hear from the youth in the West. We're all the time saying that we need to listen to the youth. But if, if when you look at indigenous uh, communities, it's usually the, or in many cases, it's the elderly that are passing down the information from one generation to the next. And I wanted to ask you about your um, um, maybe thoughts about that, or where, where is, where is, the, where can the line be um, connected between what is, um, you know, the Western culture that we have been. Uh, developing over the hundred the last 150 years compared to that and the other thing that I thought a lot about because maybe some of the people here are a bit younger than uh, let's say than myself but if I think of my grandparents generation 
there was a lot more sustainability in the way they lived. So mm-hmm. even, even if you're looking uh, 80, 90 years ago in the West or in, you know, in, there was there were values or the, there were things that were uh, very connected to, you know, to a logical, sustainable, and that mm-hmm. is lost as well. So we're not to, with that that discussion between the generations, even in the West, is lost. So that's my question to you. I, th- I think there are there are wisdoms throughout the generations. So I really see strongly teenage wisdom um, as a thing. I I see it every day in my life, um, and uh, yeah. So I I totally uh, respect and honor teenage wisdom. But I think what you're saying is very uh, very valid that um, th- there is also a um, well, I, yeah. I mean, I can't speak for, for for teenagers and young people being middle aged myself, but I I, I feel um, you know I, th- I I feel there's an element of what I felt when I was a young person, and that is where is the eldership I can respect. Um, my culture is obsessed with money. My culture locks people away. My culture wages war for its resources. Um, <laughs> my elders and my politicians fight like um, like very immature people in parliament. Um, uh, and while uh, the last several years has, or the last, 10 years, um, my partner Meg and I have been really seeking out community elders um, and in reinstating community elders. And these are not necessarily high profile people in our community. These are people who are deeply uh, philosophical, deeply caring and have done a lot of grief work and looked at the state of the world and held um, and, and not shied away from their grief and through that become very wise people. So I feel your question is really pertinent to, I, I guess, you know, we can just talk about goats and we can just talk about forests in very sort of mechanistic ways, but this is about behavior change. And this is about reinstating what we've lost when we used to, um, uh, when young people went through rites of passage in order to find their gifts to, to, beautifully and uh, separate from their parents in order to become fully fledged adults in the village or in another village if they moved um, in order to know themselves and to know what gifts they have we've lost that we basically young we uh, as a culture sell a whole lot of shit to younger people a whole lot of stuff to put in their bodies that are not good for them a whole lot of stuff that means a whole lot of extracting from the earth. So I feel um, that, yeah, that that, that there is disconnect. There is not respect for eldership when our eldership is trammeling the earth. So I feel like these things, but that story, if we continue to perpetuate that story, we also continue to perpetuate the trammeling of the earth. So the new story that, um, you know, we and people like Charles Eisenstein and many, many indigenous thinkers and scholars are talking about is that let's not stay in the sickness of the old story, of the story of separation, the story of separation between teenagers and and elderly folk. Um, Let's actually start to rebuild teenage initiation, mentorship, and then eldership um, as, as, you know, while we're also renewing forests, because it's the same work. We're renewing ourselves, we're renewing our culture in order to um, uh, t- to move beyond the story of separation. And the story of separation is the story of climate change, of species collapse, of all those things that we're facing. So um, yeah, so Charles Eisenstein is, a, is an incredible thinker in this space, but there are many, many others. Another um, fantastic person in this uh, to look up um, is Francis Weller and he wrote a book uh, called um, uh, The Wild Edge of Sorrow and that really goes into the heart I think of what you're you're asking about uh, about generational grief really because I think it all gets down to grief 
separate our separation from one another and respect for eldership is uh and even you know and older elder older folk not respecting teenage wisdom or not even understanding that that's a thing um is yeah is this is because we're all separated from one another thank you mm -hmm. great Thank you, Daniel, for the question. Thank you, Patrick, for your wonderful answers. Uh, I think we've had some uh, uh, really great questions coming in and uh, and thank you very much for elaborating um, on your answers. Um, I think we can uh, close the meeting. Um, just reminding everyone that the webinar will be available online if you want to go back. Uh, the links uh, to the um, video will also be available. Um, yeah, so. Have a nice day wherever you are or have a nice rest of the week. Or a good night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have a good night's sleep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Nicole. Thank you everybody for coming.